All right, ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic shows an urgent need of using technology more intensive in the entire healthcare ecosystem. Pharma, well, maybe already saved the world, and I'm really excited to have one of the leading figures when it comes to implementing blockchain technology in the pharmaceutical industry with us today. The CEO of Chronicle and Management Ledger, Susanne Somerville. Susanne, very warm welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Now, it's already an end of the afternoon here, but I think you're just waking up in San Francisco. Is that correct? That's correct, but uh, thrilled uh, to be able to participate um, in your amazing event. And we're thrilled to have you also with us. So thank you so much um, about that. Um, curious to learn, what is shortly, what is Chronicles, what is uh, MediLedger? Yeah, so uh, my um, uh, career has been in uh, biotech and pharmaceuticals. And I um, am so thrilled I've had the opportunity to bridge uh, the work of how this industry works with these exciting technologies like blockchain. Um, Meta Ledger, uh, the Meta Ledger network is what Chronicled has built um, and is deploying and, and is in production in the United States with major pharmaceutical companies. Um, and the aim is to use blockchain to um, enable um, the automation of business between companies. Um, it may seem a little sexy um, at the start, but I think all of us now have experienced that supply chain and business processes within these companies are actually very critical to delivering things like vaccines to the world, uh, PPE and other things. So we've been looking at these core processes because I don't know if you know, uh, McKinsey just came out with a report in the United States alone, the cost of just running healthcare, the administration costs are a trillion dollars a year. Um, and this really comes from the fact that um, healthcare has been um, local um, and companies have sort of grown and um, developed independently. And so um, healthcare isn't interoperable um, in the United States and other parts of the world at, at, at the way that we all could vision it could be that could really provide benefit for how medicines are delivered, how um, diseases are understood. Um, so that's what we started. And we've started in a, a few basic corners of supply chain and revenue management but our visions are much greater that really all this administrative burden um, can um, be worked at. I can't say it's all gonna be eliminated, but I think a tremendous amount uh, can go away. Yeah, it's interesting what you mentioned because also in the Netherlands, there's uh, different uh, blockchain startups that are wor really working in the uh, healthcare sector to bring more efficiency, to remove all the data silos, to you know let organizations work together. So what I understand is that uh, Meta Ledger is doing this between the pharmaceutical companies and digitizing uh, the supply chains, so putting basically medicines on the blockchain. So we actually aren't technically putting it on the blockchain. I think that's what people imagine. Yeah. Blockchain actually, when we really look at the design and it's one of the things I'm really proud of, um, as we've sort of talked about the, the, at least in other people's use cases, energy issues, it's actually not a very efficient um, uh, use of, uh, of computing power. So what we actually do is we use the blockchain to put um, data that really should be shared across all the parties Things like the um, um, item numbers that identify medicines would be a good example. This is public information. And yet everyone, if you could imagine, loads it into their system independently. Thousands and thousands of times, let's say a Pfizer you know, vaccine, everyone takes that item number and puts it in their system by themselves. Why wouldn't we have a single source that actually comes from Pfizer that everyone knows can be trusted and allow that be the source for everyone to input into their system? The other thing we use the blockchain for is proofs. So we put their cryptographic proofs. Um, they're actually relatively, I would say, um, small from a computing power perspective there. And it enables people to prove business rules between trading partners. So you don't need to trust that your trading partner put the data in their system. There are proofs that these events happened. And these are proofs that everyone can unilaterally trust. Um, and it's those proofs then that drive um, the automation capability. There's still private data being exchanged between parties. So it's really a two layer system. And the blockchain really becomes almost, if you can imagine the regulator who checks all the rules um, as uh, business and information is exchanged so that 
everyone knows the rules are being met. So you're speaking about proofs. Is it also used to proof if you actually have a real or a fake medicine? Because I've read that like hundreds of thousands of people, especially in the development countries, are still dying because of taking fake medicines. Is it also used by uh, by, by your company actually to put like you know the the proofs on the blockchain so people can check if they have like real medicines? It's a great um, example. And it is absolutely one of the um, uh, proof of concepts that we have. Um, I don't know if you know that um, in the United States and other countries in the world, including the Netherlands, prescription medicine is serialized now. So there's a unique serial number on every box of medicine. Um, and in the United States, uh, Europe is already doing this, but in the United States, the law states that by 2023, there will be an electronic interoperable system to manage this track and trace. So uh, we believe blockchain is foundational to enable the, the assurance that drugs are not counterfeit. We can literally register, and again, I'll pick on Pfizer, that the medicine came from Pfizer to begin with. They're the licensed manufacturer. And every exchange in business, every time it changes hands, it can be checked again that it's a valid change of ownership so that by the time it gets into the pharmacy or consumer's hands, they can be assured by, I'll call it, if you could imagine, a green check mark uh, on their system that all the rules were met in the system, which assures them that it came from Pfizer and is not counterfeit. We do have a solution that is in production today. This is to verify product. So a drug that has um, been returned to a wholesaler in the United States, for example, they can scan the barcode and in less than a second, it routes to the manufacturer's database and checks that the data elements on that box of medicine match what's in the manufacturer's database. This is, I would say, an enormous step forward in anti-counterfeiting. I'm not going to claim that it's perfect, um, but it is, a, a, I would call it a 99% fix already that's being used in the United States. Wow. That's, yeah, I was actually going to ask you. I mean, there's a great ideas, there are great visions, but what kind of practical solutions can we as a consumer already use? Or is it more really to bring efficiency to the supply chain, so more for the corporations for their internal use and corporation to corporation? Or are there already for consumers, consumers in the Netherlands, possibilities to work with blockchain? Yeah. So I'm not sure from the companies that are in the Netherlands. Again, we started in the United States because healthcare, honestly, is enormous and it is done so differently in every country in the world. But our hope is that the work we're doing can expand beyond the United States. But our initial work actually brought companies together because of this U.S. legislation. They were going to need to be interoperable. So this product verification that helps improve security, as I mentioned, is in production in the United States today. Uh, the next work that's in production, again, has to do with the revenue management. So it's not consumer touching yet, but our aim and hope is that this drives costs out of healthcare to make it more affordable um, and can hopefully uh, pass those costs on to the, the execution and delivery of healthcare. But I think uh, we are slow and cautious because the companies we're working with are very big and very complicated. And so um, I'm super excited about crypto and NFTs and all the you know future, but these companies are um, I'll call it a thousand, to, you know a, you know ten thousand miles away from that today. Yeah. Our aim is to really connect their core systems using blockchain. Blockchain enables the fact that everyone can trust the rules and know no one's cheating, and then expand the uses and capabilities from here. Yeah, that's interesting. Like you mentioned uh, that the data is trustworthy. Um, now, if we're looking into the real world, like how are you working on this to make the data trustworthy? Because you're also working, I guess, in an ecosystem where not everybody is trusting each other all the time. So how is this data being checked? Right. So what's interesting is we've actually leveraged from the blockchain ethos how do you design systems that incentivize everyone to do the right thing? And I'll go back to that Pfizer drug. Um, when it gets verified, the system is designed that Pfizer is onboarded. No one can um, fake being Pfizer, only one Pfizer allowed. And, uh, Pfizer, and this is used um, to get a little geeky here. There are data standards around the world that um, uh, regulate the, the design of what an item number of a drug is. So in that design are numbers that only Pfizer owns. 
And that now becomes the key that Pfizer is the only one who can control or change that data. But what's great is if Pfizer wants their drugs verified in the world and they're the only ones who can control the data, it's a perfect setup because they're incentivized to get it right. If their data is wrong in the system, then their drugs are all going to come back as false because it won't match up and it won't actually send the messages to their database. So we think a lot about this incentivization. Can we get the people who actually create the data to own the data for everyone? And again, it is in their best interest that that data is set up correctly and working um, to ensure the validity. The other thing we do is in the United States, there are a lot of identifier databases that are used to identify hospitals and pharmacies. We actually run Pfizer's data against it to ensure that all their customer records are accurate. So if anything, you can imagine our system is almost self-cleaning. Every time a company is exchanging data with a trading partner, it checks their data. Hey, you've got all these mistakes, fix them. So that when a trading partner gets it, the trading partner knows it's validated, but then it's their turn. When they send the data, it gets checked so that any mistakes in their system are validated. And what's neat about this, we had manufacturers ask us all the time, hey, can, you can your system show us that the trading partner put the data in their system? And our answer is you don't need to care anymore if your trading partner is doing it right or wrong because when the data or transaction comes back to you, if it didn't meet the rules, it will be stopped. So you won't be bothered with erroneous, erroneous transactions. They will need to fix it before it can be passed on to you. Wow. Now, um, what are the potential downsides when we look at this kind of infrastructure? I mean, you spoke a lot, a lot about all these great ideas and possibilities and already <coughs> working applications. What are potential downsides? So I don't know if I really see downsides because honestly, this makes the system work better. One of the benefits for the industry, which I think is a neat um, uh, uh, analogy to personal information, there's a lot of discussion that people should be able to own their data and have their privacy. There's GDPR in Europe. Um, we actually have designed our system that companies control and manage their own data. I'll note Chronicled as a company who's built the Meta Ledger network, and I'll say as the custodian, we have no access to companies' private data. These systems and solutions are truly run decentralized. So if you look at data as being valuable to you personally, it's also valuable to companies. And rather than having a middleman to give the data to, who actually then honestly mines it and sells the data back to the industry, why wouldn't we let the companies do that themselves? So I actually think this future is bright for companies, for reducing inefficiency, for making drugs safer. Um, maybe the only downside is all of us being patient to let companies implement these solutions. Um, uh, their, their core systems are complicated um, uh, and, and the patience to get there because then the innovation is really gonna start. Once this plumbing exists between companies, they're communicating directly with trading partners. There's no longer middlemen in between. Um, there's a lot of exciting stuff that's going to happen. Now, um, you've been speaking a lot about uh, Pfizer. I think you work there as well, right? No, I used to work at Genentech, which okay. is the yeah. Roche, Hoffman yeah. LaRoche uh, subsidiary in the United States. Okay. Um, I'm curious to learn as well. I mean, Pfizer has already uh, created the vaccine, the, one of the leading vaccines beating uh, Corona. Um, did you also already work on, uh, for example, this vaccine, putting it on the blockchain or putting parts on it, uh, of it on the blockchain? I wish that was true. Okay. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> because of the urgency to deliver the vaccine, it was exempt from the serialization requirements because it takes extra time um, to, and it slowed things down. But um, my belief is very soon with the systems we've built that uh, the processes associated with the vaccine will be encompassed in what we're doing. It sort of sits in a special category of many, many things. <laughs> and so it sort of is, is, is touched by as few things as possible to let it move and uh, be delivered as fast as possible. Um, but eventually, absolutely, uh, we'll be helping there too. You were mentioning uh, cryptos, NFTs. Are you also bringing NFTs into this ecosystem or was that just... Uh... Uh, yeah, not yet. <laughs> um, again, these companies tend to be relatively conservative. And so we've really taken approach. Um, as I mentioned, we brought them together as a working group starting honestly back in 2017 to educate them and explore what might be possible. One of the things that is very special about what we've done is we don't view blockchain as a solution for a company. It's a solution for an industry. 
So the way to make it work is bring them together and get them to agree on these industry level protocols to help drive that efficiency. If everyone can run the same protocol, it actually benefits the whole industry. The example I often give is that driving our cars. Driving our cars is a very complicated protocol, but it wouldn't work if everyone drove a car their own way. By having cities and societies decide to drive cars the same way, think of all the innovation and efficiency that was enabled because of that. So we've really set our sights high. Let's bring the major industry players together. Let's agree on an industry protocol. Um, and so we've started there. We have major companies like Pfizer and Genentech. We have the major wholesalers in the United States. Um, three of them move 95% of all drugs. They're all participating. So we're very confident this example for the industry of how we can set an industry protocol in place will happen. But back to your question, crypto and NFTs, um, volatile, um, uh, not fully understood. We are exploring ways that we can slowly show the industry how we can enable that to happen. We're looking at opportunities to drive an open network. The Metal Ledger network today is permissioned, but that is only because there was no public infrastructure that was ready to enable companies like this. And, and I'll give you a good example. Every pharmaceutical company requires an extensive IT security review. We would often joke, where would they go to do an extensive IT security re review of Ethereum? I don't even know who they would go to, to, to get that done. So really trying to bridge, I'll call it the old world and how they do business to get them involved, to then start getting excited about ways to connect to the new world. Right, so it will take some years before we can get some digital medicines in the metaverse, like some NFTs that are actually for the virtual people. When they are sick, they also need medicines, of course. It will take some time. That's we're going to get there. We're, we're getting we're there. About it and uh, we'll slowly get them there. <laughs> Wonderful. Suzanne Somerville, thank you so much for joining us. It was really interesting to uh, speak with you about all these great things that you're doing with Metal Ledger and uh, Chronicle. Um, thank you so much for joining us and uh, rock on with all the great work. Thank you.